Hello, everyone. This Sabbath, September 19, 2020, will be a different date, of course, if you're, hear, if you're hearing this in future years. But this Sabbath will be the Feast of Trumpets. Now, most people think that the Feast of Trumpets is all about when the seventh trumpet sounds and the dead in Christ are resurrected. We all rise up to meet Christ in the clouds. And then from there, we immediately come back down to the Mount of Olives and start the millennial reign of Christ after he defeats the armies that are gathered there. The traditional teaching over the years, and probably 20 years ago I taught this as well, 15 years ago maybe even, I don't know, but is that the seventh trumpet, meeting with Christ, returning to the Mount of Olives, all happens on the same day, on the Feast of Trumpets. Well, I'm going to talk about that today because I, I've come to see that it can't be, it just can't be all on the same day, and that the resurrection for the first fruits of God's children just doesn't match, uh, because if the Feast of Trumpets is the beginning of the Fall Holy Days, and the Fall Holy Days all picture the final chain of events uh, leading up to God the Father himself revealing himself to all of us. Anyway, my point is, my point is, uh, the spring holy days picture the first fruits, the fall holy days picture God working with the rest of creation. So uh, most seem to believe, though, that all of what I just said happens on one day on the Feast of Trumpets. And so now before we get into, though, a discussion about the mechanics, the timing, uh, the doctrine, if you will, of this particular teaching, I hope we can all agree that the most important thing is not necessarily that we all see exactly correctly what the sequence of events will be or when, when, when things happen, but the fact that it does picture some way, somehow, on this day, Yeshua coming back, the Son of God coming back to earth. That's exciting. When we look at the mess the world's in right now, that's exciting. And so just imagine the, when the Messiah does return with all of his millions of holy angels, and uh, what a grand, grand day that's going to be. Talk about an invasion from outer space, right? So hello, everyone. I'm everyone. I'm Philip Shields, host and founder of Light on the Rock. And thank you for coming. And I hope that uh, if you enjoy the sermons that I have for this, for this website, that you keep coming. Uh, I'm trying a few ads here and there uh, on some of the sermons uh, just to get it out to more people. But the fact is, if you do enjoy it, we're gonna, I, I, I just can't afford. I just can't afford the ads. And so uh, I'm, I'm hoping that by doing a few ads, more people find out about it and they keep coming to this site without the ads in the future. And of course, you tell other people about this as well. Uh, that would help tremendously if you would do that. Uh, so we are to keep the Feast of Trumpets. Turn to Leviticus 23. We'll put it on the board. Uh, Leviticus 23 lists all the holy days. And so Leviticus 23, verse 23, 25, has almost the shortest description of what this day is about or what happens on it, much, much less than what's said about Passover or Pentecost or, or even the Feast of Tabernacles and so on. And then the Lord, or Jehovah, spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, On the seventh month, in the seventh month, that's the Hebrew seventh month, on the first day of that seventh month, that usually ends up being around September, October, uh, mid-September usually, like this year. You shall have a Sabbath rest, a memorial of blowing of trumpets. Actually, the Hebrew, I think, just says blowing. A memorial of blowing. And so the assumption was that he meant trumpets. So you'll see in italics in your King James Bible, whenever you see something in italics in King James or New King James, it's showing that those were added by the translators to try to clarify the meaning, but we're not in the original language. It's a memorial of blasts is what it is. Noise, including trumpets. But it will also be shouts, and it will be terror. It will be excitement. It will be applause. It will be screams. That's what this day is about, a holy convocation, meaning we should get together. With COVID-19, that's tougher, but we should still try somehow to do it. You shall do no customary work on it. You shall offer an offering made by fire. God makes it clear in other verses you are allowed to cook on the holy days and to prepare for the group or whatever. 
So the day this year, 2020, will be September 19. In other years, it will be mid-September, but different dates. Um, now, in 2009, I was in Israel with my wife, and I, I remember being down south of the South Wall, uh, maybe 200 yards away from the South, maybe further than that, and I was at the archaeological dig where they think they're, they're, they're uncovering the, uh, the, 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 the palace, David's palace. Anyway, I was there, and there was a, a prominent Jewish rabbi there as well, and we were now facing the Mount of Olives off to the distance. Mount of Olives is just a big hill, really. And um, they're not used to our American mountains, you know, 12, 13, 14,000 feet. This is probably, probably just five or 600 feet higher than where we were. Anyway, I said to the rabbi, I said, what do you think will, when do you think it'll happen that Zechariah 14 talks about where the, uh, the Lord will come back and land on the Mount of Olives and it shall split in two uh, from the north, north and south, sp splitting east and west, but half will go to the north, half will go to the south. And he looked, like, he looked at me like I was talking to a cow. In other words, he had no grasp of what on earth I was talking about. He said, what do you mean, book of Zechariah? I said, I think you might say Zakaria or something like that. Oh, Zakaria, whatever, whatever the correct way in Hebrew is. And so anyway, but he still didn't have a clue what I was talking about. Because the Jews do keep this day, but they don't recognize the main meaning of this day, that on this day we expect the Messiah will land on the Mount of Olives. We don't know the day or hour, Christ said, but I will say this. I think part of that's because, and I'll read that pretty soon, it's a day of clouds and gloominess. I, in one of my sermons that I gave a few months ago, I talked about how the earth is described as a teetering, tottering drunkard when God begins to shake the heavens and the earth. It may be difficult to even know if it's daytime or nighttime. There'll be so much ash and debris in the skies. And not only that, but whatever it means, it's tottering like a drunkard, you see. So, um, so the Jews miss the point that has to do with Messiah, and the Jews, they believe that the main thing about, about uh, Rosh Hashanah, which is not even mentioned that way in the Bible except one place in Ezekiel, has nothing to do with this day. It just means head of the year, the start of the year. They, so they, to them, it's the, it's the uh, new year, uh, even though Christ said, or God said, that uh, in, in, uh, in Exodus 12, that this month of Aviv shall be the beginning of, of, of the year for you, the beginning of months, the beginning of the year. My point, though, it's a new year to them. They, they, in this day, they, they go back and commemorate the creation, and then they also begin what they call the 10 days of awe, 10 days of soul-searching, repentance, ending on Day of Atonement, hoping God will put their name for one more year in the Book of Life. So that's how they look at the Feast of Trumpets or Rosh Hashanah. But anyway, they miss the biggest meaning of all, that on this day, their Messiah, whom they miss, if they don't recognize him soon, they'll miss him again. So let's get back, get a running start at it. The world's a mess. It's in a mess. And I've got to tell you that it's not going to get better. There will be points, and as I understand it, there will be times when it will seem to be getting better. Peace and safety, then sudden destruction, right? Those verses... Uh, also, as in the days of Lot and Noah, they're building and giving in marriage and, and planting vineyards and all of that. So there will be times when in the years ahead of us, it will seem things are getting better. And then it gets really bad again for a while. Big war breaks out again, a big stock market crash or economic crash again. And then things get better slightly again. Let's look at what it says in Luke 21. Luke 21, Matthew 24 are the prophecies of the last days by Yeshua. Luke 21, 25 to 28. There will be signs in the sun, the moon, the stars, and on the earth distress of nations. A lot of anxiety. With perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. That's talking about tsunamis and earthquakes and hurricanes. You know, earthquakes cause tsunamis. And men's heart failing them. They're having heart attacks and strokes and things. From fear and the expectation of things which are coming on the earth, they're just afraid what's next for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud, in a cloud, not on a white horse. Understand this. As I teach it, some of us teach it, not just me. Christ, when he comes back, is coming 
in two passes, if you will, two, two times. First time in a cloud, like it says, second time on a white horse. No one got confused. Two different comings there, separated by just a few months. They'll see the Son of Man, that's Yeshua, coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now, when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. Yeshua is telling his disciples and us today, we're the ones that he really was talking to at that verse. Look up, be encouraged, don't be dismayed, don't be terrified. Don't say, oh man, what terrible, everything's happening, everything's going wrong. No, everything's supposed to go wrong for a while and then Christ comes and fixes it, right? So instead of us getting down, and I've had to fight that anxiety and the angst and as well and the depression, we believers should see past all that and our redemption draws nigh. So Christ has to come back soon because Matthew 24, 22 says, if he doesn't, all, all life would, no life would be saved alive. Good reason to come. Another reason is he's got to finally at some point institute his government, the way of God, ruled by God, ruled by the Son of God for the thousand year millennial reign. And then it goes on from there from other things. Uh, but since America and the world has kicked God out of society, out of government, out of the schools, we see nothing but this resulting consequence, the rotting decay right to its core, and evils are happening. So Christ has to come back to right everything back. You know, our, that's why our beloved America especially is, is just being rocked, shaken, the Bible says, shaken, okay? The heavens and the earth will be shaken. Are you feeling a bit of shaking going on in America right now and around the world with COVID-19 and the riots and all the things going on? Absolutely. It's just beginning. It's going to get a lot worse. But America at one time, not that long ago, we were a shining light on a hill that the world could look to. We talked about the Bible. We printed Bibles and gave them all around the world. We put them in all the motels and hotels. And then it started to change. And Time after time, God was kicked out. His way of looking at things was thrown out. And it goes right back. Now, for example, I'm talking about America because we've got to understand, please understand, that under King David and Solomon, you had 12 tribes, really 13 tribes. Joseph had two. They were considered equal tribes to the others. But if you count Joseph as one, then you're 12 tribes all under one kingdom, all under one king. And then after Solomon died, his son wasn't very popular, and the northern ten tribes, led by Ephraim, the younger son of Joseph, who was given the dominance by God, and uh, they rebelled. They rebelled, and they formed the house of Israel. And then in the south, you had Judah and Benjamin and Levi, forming the house of Judah. So the country in the Middle East called Israel is really what we would in Bible times, when the Bible was being written, called the house of Judah. The northern ten tribes went into captivity first. They had long disobeyed God on the Sabbath and the signs of his people, circumcision, the Sabbath, different things, and they forgot they were children of God. And they were lost to history. But God tells us in Genesis 49 what's going to befall each tribe, named tribe by tribe, in the last days. So obviously, Ephraim, Manasseh, Dan, and, and uh, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Naphtali, Issachar, all of them have to be around today someplace. Have to be. And why is it that the Bible mentions Ethiopia and Libya and Egypt somehow doesn't mention America? It does. It's called Israel. It's called Ephraim in the Bible. Ephraim became the symbolic leader of the ten northern tribes. And we used to sing, God bless America, until the former president who used to go to this church and his preacher would talk about, no, God, he'd say, damn America. He wouldn't say, bless America. 
I was just reading, you know, in the old days, I mean, when this country was founded, it was founded based on the Bible as best as they understood it. There's a lot they understood wrong. They didn't keep the Sabbath and other things, but as best as they could understand it, they prayed to God Almighty. George Washington did. Abraham Lincoln did. Many of the leaders did. Ronald Reagan did. Many, many prayed to God Almighty. In George Washington's first inaugural address, he made it very clear that our nation was where it was and was doing as well as it was entirely by God's blessings. And after that, he led all of Congress by foot, on foot. They walked down to a church chapel not far from where he gave his speech. And the senators and the congressmen and George Washington, the president, together dedicated themselves and the country to God and to his blessings and to his oversight. How far have we come from that foundation? That chapel, by the way, still stands. It's at ground zero. And it's a testimony that what they started, God is saying, if you don't get back to me and repent, I'm going to pluck up what I've built, as Jonathan Kahn has taught. Jonathan Kahn, by the way, comes so close to understanding, I don't know if he does get it, though, that America is Ephraim, is Israel of the Bible. Ephraim, specifically. I, many, many of you believe U.S. is Manasseh because Ephraim was supposed to be a company of nations. But look, America is the dominant country. America is the leader. And that was supposed to be Ephraim's spot. And uh, America is younger than Britain. Uh, Ephraim is younger than Manasseh. And also the fact that America is a, is, a, is a company of 50 countries, really, that are united, the 50 United States or countries. So I personally really believe that all of the prophecies uh, of Ephraim really are talking about America. Anyway, my point is um, the promises that you read about and the blessings that you read about in Deuteronomy 28, just jot that down and sometime tonight go back and read it. God says, if you will obey me, if you will seek me, if you will do my words, I will bless you in the field and, and the heavens and the rain and the fruit of the land and in your children and your health. Everything will be blessed. But if you turn apart away from me, you're going to have trouble like you've never seen before. So anyway, so God has to send his son. And if he didn't come on time or soon, there would be no flesh saved alive. In Matthew 22, verses 1 and 2, Jesus gave a parable. If you've heard my series on the wedding of the Lamb, you kind of have an idea where I'm going here. But I have to give this background again so that we tie it in to the Feast of Trumpets. Matthew 22, verse 1 and 2. Jesus answered and spoke and said to them by parable, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son. Who's the son? Yeshua. Who's the king? God the Father, obviously. Where is that king? Our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name, right? So what I'm getting at is, uh, God's the king, the father, putting on the wedding for Christ. I gave a series, three sermons recently, on the wedding of the lamb. And I hope you'll all hear those three. You've got to hear those three. Uh, help you understand this sermon. Since we are the first fruits of the kingdom of God, James 1.18 says that. Let's put it up there. James 1.18 a kind of first fruits of his creation. It makes sense for the first resurrection, our resurrection, and the wedding to take place not in the fall holy days that have nothing to do with us as being first fruits, but in the spring and early summer, the Pentecost one. On Pentecost, when they also when Israel also married God at Mount Sinai. The fall holy days is about the rest of the world. The spring holy days it's about those being called and worked with by God now. So it makes no sense for our resurrection to be in the fall like I was always taught growing up. It will be Pentecost. That's what makes sense. Well, people say, wait a minute, but it's Feast of Trumpets. And, when, and uh, you know, trumpets are blown on this day. Yeah, trumpets are blown on all the holy days. Numbers 10.10 10 says that. So... Um, uh, Pentecost was, and everything happened specifically on specific days. Christ was killed on Passover. He went up on the day of uh, the, the, the the day of uh, first fruits, the wave sheaf, and and so on. Then by the time we come to uh, Pentecost, 
That's when the Holy Spirit came. That's when also the law was given in the Old Testament. And that's when God married Israel. And so, yes, what's next is the Feast of Trumpets. And uh, at the last trump of seven trumpets that are sounded, indeed, those of us who have God's Spirit will be resurrected, changed in a moment, the blink of an eye. But that's not going to be in the fall. I really believe that that fits in Pentecost. And I'll tell you some more reasons why in just a second. And again, remember that Numbers 10.10 10 says, All the holy days had the trumpets blown on them. The trumpets will be blown on the Feast of Trumpets, Rosh Hashanah, uh, Yom uh, Teruah, they call it in Hebrew. And they're blown on Pentecost. They're blown on all the holy days. On your own, let's, you, you should read the last 20 verses or so, 1 Corinthians 15. I want to read what it says in verse 51 to 53. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 53. Uh, so anyway, our resurrection and change, I really believe, happens on or about Pentecost. And then what? If you heard my, if you heard my sermon about the wedding of the Lamb, we then go to heaven. That's what Revelation shows us. We then go to heaven and get married, Revelation 19. And then after the wedding, we now come back on white chargers, angelic spirit, white horses. Remember, spirits and even demons look very much like a lot of things we're familiar with. Everything from, everything from uh, eagles to uh, frogs to whatever. And so I believe those horses are really powerful, smart, angelic beings. And then we come back and land on the Mount of Olives. I'm, I'm going to say that several times to get people used to a, a change from Every, thinking everything is going to happen. Uh, it can't. I'm going to keep showing you that. Behold, I tell you a mystery. 1 Corinthians 15, 51. We shall not all sleep or die, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling, in the blink of an eye, that fast, at the last trumpet, probably the seventh trumpet, trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this incorruptible must put on incorruption, mortal put on immortality. Then we'll put up Daniel 12 next. It's talking about the great time of trouble, Daniel 12, verse 1, such as there never was since there was a nation, so a horrible time of trouble. At that, but at that time, your people will be delivered. That should give us encouragement. At that time, your people will be delivered, everyone who's found written in the book, the book of life. Okay, And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. This is talking about the resurrection, verse 2, Daniel 12, verse 2 some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. So our calling is not just to go to church and read the Bible. Our calling is to also help turn people to righteousness. Our calling is to make disciples. Our calling is to speak of Christ Speak of the kingdom of God. Speak of the way of God. Turn many to righteousness. They will shine like the stars. So why do I teach the seven trumpet sounds on Pentecost? Then we come back probably on the Feast of Trumpet. Trumpets, here's the sequence of his coming. Since we're first fruits, the symbolism of first fruits fits much better in the spring holy days. And then uh, the scripture also shows, I mentioned this already, I'll keep mentioning it that the first time he comes, he's in the clouds, he gathers his elect, we'll read that, and then the second time he's on a horse, not the clouds. Two different times to take power the second time. Also understand this. We can read of the seventh trumpet, I believe it's mentioned first in Revelation 11, at the seventh trumpet, the last trumpet, you know, there's loud voices, now the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Christ, of our Lord and of his Christ, his Messiah. After that seventh trumpet, you can read about it, especially in Revelation 16, but it's introduced in Revelation 15. There are seven more last plagues, seven more bowl, B-O-W-L, bowl plagues. And during the same time, I believe, now first of all, if we go over, if you read Revelation 16, you'll see that these bowl plagues, I'm getting ahead of myself. The way we were always taught was the seventh trumpet sound, the last trumpet, we're changed to spirit, we meet Christ in the air on a cloud, 
And then somehow he gets on a horse, I guess, and there's seven last plagues that are being poured out. What are we doing? You know, one of those plagues, I think it's the sixth one, is that uh, the Euphrates is dried up and these hordes from the east come over. That's going to take weeks and weeks. So between the seventh trump blowing and the seven last plagues being completed has to be, has to be several months or else it's hardly a plague if it's just a couple minutes. So the old teaching was we're all just hovering above Jerusalem and then fighting the armies that haven't got gathered yet because that's the sixth plague where they all come. But when they finally get there, then they're destroyed and we all come down. And, and somehow this all happened all on Feast of Trumpets, all within a 24-hour period. It makes no sense time-wise. So, for example, if you go through the seven plagues of Revelation 16, the first one uh, was swords on all those who were worshiping the beast and part of his had the number uh, on them. The second one was the sea becoming blood, killing everything in the sea. Third one was the same thing happening to all the rivers and springs. And the fourth one was the sun scorching people. It was so hot. There will be global warming for sure at this time. And then the fifth one was the sun uh, turned to darkness over the beast-powered lands. And then the sixth one, the Euphrates dries up so hordes of armies can march across and come across to uh, Israel and gather at Har Megiddo uh, in the north of Israel. That's where we get the Armageddon uh, wording. And then the seventh one is the greatest earthquake the world's ever seen. Cities all around the world collapse. It's a worldwide earthquake. Hail the size of a hundred pound, hundred pound hail coming down from the sky. Anything that's going to hit is going to be demolished. Mountains will be collapsed. Islands will disappear. Tsunamis are happening. Cities are falling. That's what it says. Hail, hundred pounds. Greatest earthquake ever. That's the seventh final bowl plague. All of those take months to happen. Months. So that's why I'm saying that once we're resurrected and meet him in the clouds, everything I see shows that we then go to heaven because it shows 144,000 standing on the sea of glass. And uh, you know, it, it's just all there. In Revelation 19, the wedding of the Lamb. And we're actually acting out now what Rebecca did when she agreed to marry Isaac. Isaac was a type of Christ, the son of Abraham. Abraham was a type of God the Father. And Abraham uh, wanted to choose the, the bride for Isaac through the messenger that he sent out. He says, God the Father chooses us and then gives us to Jesus Christ. So Rebecca came over all the way from a long ways away and left her country to go to Isaac, who was with his father, Abraham. That's all in the end of Genesis 24. We'll put it up there, Genesis 24, verses 59 to 67. You can go back and read it again if you're not familiar with that. The bridegroom, Yeshua, is coming for his bride. The first time will be on the clouds. Matthew 24, verses 30 to 31. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man. Everybody's going to see him like lightning going across from one side of the sky to the other. All around the world, they'll see him coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. This is the seventh trump. And they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. From all around the world, he's going to gather his elect. Some will be probably in a place of safety, and others will not have gone to a place of safety, but will still be gathered together as his elect. Who are the elect? It's not any corporate group. I promise you that. It's not. The elect are simply those, Romans 8, verses 9 and 14, who are led by God's Spirit. Now remember, so this happens, I'm saying, on Pentecost. Remember the two leavened loaves that were raised by the high priest on Pentecost. Two leavened loaves that were raised. Uh, I think that's in Leviticus 23 as well. And, uh, and then brought back down. That pictures us, the people of God, from Abel till the last person given God's Spirit. So I, I, I really believe we're very close. I, I personally have now come to believe, uh, 
and I, you know, if it doesn't happen this way, then God's will be done. But I, I personally now believe that this could all wrap up within 10 years, by the 10th year, by 2030. Um, I don't think it's going to happen in two or three or five years. A lot still has to happen. The Great Tribulation, the Temple, the Ark, the sacrifices, many things. I'll give a whole sermon on what has yet to happen. So once they're married in heaven, then they come back, uh, Christ and the, the bride and all of that. So after the wedding, three or so months at least have happened here on earth. Then we come back probably, I think, on the day of Pentecost, uh, trumpets to land on the Mount of Olives. Like Zechariah 14 says, like uh, uh, others say. And this time, instead of riding on the foal of a donkey, he's going to be riding on a white charger. So Revelation 19, verses 11 to 16, this is right after the wedding. Right after the wedding. So heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and, all, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire. And on him. See, he, he came not to make war before, but this time he is going to come as, as, as commander of the Lord of Hosts' armies. And his eyes were like flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had his name written on that no one knew but himself. In verse 13, he had a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called, this is not God the Father. There's a group teaching out there right now that God the Father is the one who comes and lands on the Mount of Olives. That is just plain wrong. Acts 1, the angel said, this same Jesus whom you saw go up will come back. We'll read that in a minute. In like manner, they were on the Mount of Olives at the time. And it says here, that the one who's coming back is called the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And that Word became flesh. It's talking about Jesus Christ, Yeshua, Hamashiach, Yeshua, the Messiah. And the armies in heaven, the angels clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Out of his mouth came a sharp sword with which he should strike the nations. And he rules him with a rod of iron and all of that. And he's called King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The only one that he's under is God the Father. God the Father is God Most High. God Most High. But other than God the Father, Jesus Christ, Yeshua is the King of Kings. Uh, I'm going to put in the notes some scriptures that talk about that also with him, besides the angels, will be the saints, the holy ones, the brethren, the bride, this day is about us as well, coming back with Christ. Now back to Revelation 19. We're now in verses 17 to 21. And then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather together for the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, and all these free and slave everybody. A lot of people are going to die. This angel saying, I saw the beasts, the kings of the earth, and their armies, gathered together to make war against them who sat on the horse and against his army. So it's kind of like the, uh, the movie Independence Day, where the whole world finally comes together to fight this attack from outside. And they're going to, even the beasts here and the other armies from the east and others, finally going to quit fighting each other and are going to unite to fight him. That's what it says. Verse 19, right? Revelation 19, 19. And the beast was captured, and the false prophet who worked signs in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. The rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of the one who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. So the second return, the first one, he comes on the clouds, gathers the elect. That happens on Pentecost. We go to heaven, get married, while the seven last bold plagues are being uh, are happening on earth. It takes, it takes at least three months. I wish I had more time to read more scriptures, but uh, 1 Thessalonians 3.13 says, for example, that he may establish your heart blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Now, angels are also called holy ones. But when it's, when it's saying his saints, that's the same terminology that Paul used to address each of the churches that he wrote to, to the saints in court, to the saints that be in Rome, and so on. I think this is going to be so exciting, so exciting, 
Do you thrill over this or do you panic and worry that things are going to get worse and worse and you're going to lose all your money that you have saved up or invested or your house value is going to go down or you're going to lose your job or you're going to be persecuted? Oh yeah, that's all going to happen. But you'll be protected from the worst. We just read that in Daniel 12. The children of God are going to be protected. But imagine being changed at the blink of an eye to glory, to spirit being, taken to the clouds to meet our husband, the king of kings, and then taken up to heaven to meet our father, probably on the sea of glass, and somewhere be in his holy temple up there as well, and then be introduced to the home that they, made, that they prepared for you, your own dwelling place, because Jerusalem above becomes the city of the firstborn, the city of the first fruits. That's our city. That's my city. That's what it says about Abraham in Hebrews 11, that he looked forward to a city whose builder and maker was God. Anyway, so the wedding now has taken place. We're now returning with our husband on white chargers, angelic white chargers. And where do we come to? We go to the Mount of Olives. In Acts 1, verses 9 to 12, Yeshua now is rising they can see him going up in the air. In a cloud received him out of their sight. Acts 1 verses 9 to 12. A cloud received him. He was taken up. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, two men stood by them in white apparel. These were angels. And they said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you to go to heaven will come in like manner as you saw him go to heaven. So we know who's coming back. It's Yeshua. It's not God the Father. Not yet. It's God. It's Yeshua. And then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet. Mount of Olives. Which is near Jerusalem, a couple blocks away, Sabbath day's journey. Okay? Zechariah 14, verses 3 and 4. So we now know who's coming back. It's going to be Yeshua with his bride and with the holy angels. We're going to land on the Mount of Olives. In Zechariah 14, verses 3 and 4, Jehovah will go forth and fight against the nations as he fights in the day of battle. And all of you think of little sweet Jesus. You're going to be amazed at how tough this Jesus is, this Yeshua. And in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. It says Ye Jehovah will go forth and fight. And his feet. So uh, again, I, I gave two or three sermons some months ago showing that Depending on context, Jehovah can refer either to God the Father, as in Psalm 110, verse 1, the Lord said to my Lord, uh, or it can refer to the one we know as Jesus Christ, as Yeshua. And if you disagree with me, please go back and listen to those sermons, because it's so clear when you put all the scriptures together on it. Anyway, so where are we now? The year 2020 has certainly been a watershed pivotal year. Don't you agree? I think it's been. Sabbath, September 19, Feast of Trumpets, 2020. The Hebrew, in Hebrew, it's called Yom Teruah, Day of Blast and Trumpets and Alarms. Jews call it, I think wrongly, Rosh Hashanah, ahead of the year. I do think Christ is coming relatively soon. Not in the one, two, or five years. I, not in three, four, or five years. Not. There's too many things that have to happen yet. I mean, the witnesses of the, the preaching of the two witnesses is three and a half years. A place of safety for those who are counted worthy to escape these things is three and a half years. And uh, starting of the sacrifices, many other things. I'm going to give a whole sermon on what has to happen first. Having said that, it's not going to be one, two, or five years, but maybe five to 11 or 12 years, maybe five to 10 years. But if I die an old, old man at age 100 and he hasn't come back yet, I will still love him. I will still serve him. If he hasn't returned by then, I want him to find me so doing. Matthew 24 says when that master comes back, he wants to see that his servants are working, are, are found so doing, and he will reward them. And those who are not getting much done they will be punished, Matthew 24, verses 44 to 40, 45 to 51. But imagine, I mean, even the Apostles' Day, everything looked imminent. The return looked imminent. Mount Vesuvius had erupted. That was an incredible experience. The temple had been destroyed, stone by stone, all the gold taken away. 
100,000 Jews had been crucified. The rest who weren't killed were taken as sex slaves and other kinds of slaves to work the galleys and so on. Many were killed. Famines were going on. Plague was going on. They had this weird emperor. On and on, but it wasn't. But it looks to me like we really truly are within the last final 10 or 12 years. If I'm wrong, so be it. Continue to work hard for him so that whether he's returned or not, don't be discouraged. Matthew 24, verses 42 to 44, we'll put it up there. We don't know what hour, some translations say the day, your Lord is coming. But know this, if the master of the house had known when the thief was going to come, he would have taken precautions, right? Verse 44, therefore you also be ready. Don't think you have time to get ready. My last heartbeat could be my next moment with Christ at the resurrection. The Son of Man is coming at an hour you think not. You don't expect. At an hour you don't expect. So when everyone's saying it's going to be this time, it's going to be any night now, it's going to be any year now, I'm saying, okay, I, that's probably wrong. <laughs> so, okay, what, what does the Feast of Trumpets symbolize? The fall holy days, again, as God's now beginning to work with the rest of humanity. The fall holy days begin with the Feast of Trumpets. And then on the 10th day, it's a day of atonement, a day of fasting. And then on the uh, four days after that, uh, the eve of that, begins the, on the uh, Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, 15th, I guess it is, but, but whatever. And then, and then on the eighth day is the final day. Many call the eighth day the last great day, but that's not correct. I've got a sermon on the eighth day. I've got a sermon titled, Is the last great day the last day of the feast or the eighth day? give you a little clue. The Bible says on the last great day, the, that great day of the feast. Okay? But go back and hear that one if you haven't heard that one. The upcoming Holy Days calendar, the next Holy Day is uh, this one coming up the Sabbath, September 19. These are our 2020 dates. If you're hearing this in 2021 or 22, it'll be different. And then Atonement on Monday, September 28. 2020, and then the Feast of Tabernacles, October 3 through uh, 9, and then the eighth day would be um, on October 10. Uh, so those are holy days. October 3 is a holy day. October 10 is a holy day. So I hope you're planning to keep the holy days. Certainly the early church did. They were started on the Feast of Pentecost, and Paul spoke to Gentile Corinthians about, about the feast, about Passover, about the days of unleavened bread. That was to a mostly Gentile congregation. Now with COVID-19, it may be hard for all of us to gather together, but we'll do the best we can with that. So all the fall holy days are about the upcoming prophesied events if they follow the same pattern that all the other ones have followed, some big events will happen on the specific days. Trumpets, I believe, is likely to be the holy day when Christ returns and stands on the Mount of Olives. Why would Christ say, but you don't know the day or the hour? I think it's going to be because the earth is going to be rocking and reeling like a drunkard. will not be able to be absolutely sure what day it is or what time it is. It's called the day of clouds and gloominess. It may even be hard due to all the ash and debris to figure out what day it is. So Zechariah 14, verses 6 to 7, talking about the time they'll finally end up at the uh, Mount of Olives. It shall come to pass in that day, Zechariah 14, 6 and 7, there will be no light. The lights will be diminished. It shall be one day known to Jehovah, neither day nor night, neither day nor night. So it's saying, obviously, it's going to be very, very confusing. But at evening time it shall happen that it shall be light. Okay, so are you following what, what this is saying here? So, um, I still think he actually will land on the Mount of Olives on trumpets. Some think it might be atonement. I think it's going to be trumpets. On the day of the Lord is not a good time for the world. The 
Day of the Lord. The Bible speaks of the day of the Lord. What is it? When does it start? I personally really strongly believe, and other of my friends do as well, that the day of the Lord begins probably on Feast of Trumpets one year before he returns to land on the Mount of Olives. Isaiah 34, verse 8. Talking about the day of the Lord, verse 8 says, It is the day of Jehovah, or the Lord's vengeance, the year of recompense for the cause of Zion. There comes a point where Satan's world has just had a heyday, a field day with God's servants, God's people, persecuting them, martyring them, beheading them, torturing them. Some are protected from the very worst and some are not. As you can read at the end of Revelation 12, he goes after the remnant of the church, remnant of the woman, Satan does. There comes a point where God, in his loving kindness and mercy and patience, can't stand it any longer. And he starts hitting back. Remember the scripture says, vengeance is mine. It's the day of Jehovah's vengeance, the year of recompense, Isaiah 34, verse 8. So I believe it's a year long. The day of the Lord is really a day for a year in the Bible. And the seventh seal has seven trumpets, and those seven trumpets do not, cannot roll out in one day. One of the trumpets, the fifth trumpet, for example, lasts for five months. So it takes a while for all seven trumpets to be blown. Finally, we come to the seventh trumpet and the resurrection. Um, but Amos 5, verse 18 says, Woe to you who desire the day of the of the Lord, day of Jehovah, day of darkness and not light. So that's speaking to people who are not walking God's way because um, there are other verses that say, lift up your heads, look up, for your redemption draws nigh. So uh, Joel 1.15 calls the day of the Lord a, a day of destruction from the Almighty. So since the Feast of Trumpets falls on the first sighting, of the little sliver of light. Remember, new moon in the Bible is not the dark of the moon like it is in our Western society. In the Bible, new moon is the first visible light. But if there's so much debris and ash in the clouds from volcanic eruptions, nuclear war, fires, uh, the sun scorching and all that kind of stuff, it may be impossible to even be sure what day it is. Or certainly to be able to see a moon giving any kind of a light because of all the debris. The Bible speaks of near misses from asteroids and meteors. I gave a sermon about uh, global changes coming in one of my first sermons. It's the one with me in front of a lake background. I talk about a lot of that in that sermon. Go back and hear that if you haven't. So day of the Lord, a day of Jehovah, is Jehovah's wrath on sinful, unrepentant humanity. But the good news for God's children is he spares them his anger. He's not angry at you and me. So 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 8 to 10, let's, 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 let those of us of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. God did not appoint us to wrath, but of salvation, and so on. And then 1 Thessalonians 1.10. It's a one-year period when God begins to spank the world and the sinners of the world in a really powerful way. Uh, and and uh, he's angry, very, very angry. But we should not be afraid of that anger because it's not against us. 1 Thessalonians 1.10. And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he has raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. There's also the wrath of judgment for our sins if we don't repent and accept Yeshua, but there's also this wrath that happens um, in the year-long day of the Lord. A day is as a year, it says in several places in the Bible. So we'll be persecuted by Satan's children during uh, the time of wrath. Some of God's children will have to go through the Great Tribulation. Some will be spared. And finally, it comes on the very sinful world with the seven trumpets, um, with the seven trumpet plagues. And then on top of that, the seven last bowl plagues primarily is, is, when, is when God really, really hammers home um, his wrath. But the seven trumpet plagues are also God's wrath. 
and then finally the seven bull plagues which last several months. Joel 2 calls it a day of trembling, deep darkness, and gloominess. It speaks of in Joel 2 verse 2 a massive invading army such as we've never seen before. Joel 2.11 calls it a day that is great and very terrible. Who can endure it? And uh, we should read Joel 3 as well. Verses 9 to 16, you should read it. It says, the word goes out to all the nations to prepare for war. So when Yeshua returns as conquering king this time, it's a time of cataclysmic war, such as the planet's never seen before. It's just a horrible time. And it's the area surrounding Jerusalem as well, the Valley of Jehoshaphat. It mentions that too there. Uh, so the context says that these armies will come down There'll be so many that they'll have gathered in Megiddo up in the north, up in the Galilee area, and then actually west of the Galilee area, but up, up there in the north. And then they will then, from Megiddo all the way down to the Valley of Jehoshaphat, which is the valley around Jerusalem, will be filled, filled with troops. Joel 3, verses 12 to 13 let the nations be uh, wakened and come to the valley of Jehoshaphat. That's right around Jerusalem. And there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, go down, for the winepress is full. The vats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Many, many scriptures call the day of Jehovah a day of wailing and terror and destruction. Not a time, not a great time to be on the earth, for it's a time when God himself finally gets so upset that he lets everybody know how he feels about the way they've treated his children, the way they've treated this planet. It's a time of Jehovah's vengeance, Jeremiah 46.10. Jeremiah 46.10, he says he will destroy those who destroy the earth. In fact, let's read that, Revelation 11.18. Um, the nations were angry, and your wrath has come and the time of the dead that they should be judged and you shall re your wrath has come you see that revelation 11:18 that you should reward your servants the prophets and the saints and those who fear your name small and great and who shall dis and 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 you should destroy those who destroy the earth this is just about i think the same time as the uh, seven trumpet sounds and the angels and all are saying these things about what Christ is going to do so you have the seven trumpet plagues, God's wrath, and then followed by more, the seven final bowl plagues. This earth is in for a big spanking. And it says over and over again, the majority don't even repent. Some do. Some do. Some come out of it and repent. But there are a few verses saying that some repented. But the vast majority of the time, they just hardened their hearts and would not repent. So again, two parts to Christ's coming. Seven trumpet sounds, I believe, on Pentecost or near Pentecost. We go to heaven. He collects us in the clouds. He, we then go to heaven to get married in heaven. Meet our father. Probably meet our guardian angels or other angels who work with us. And then there's a second return, this time on horses. After the wedding, we come back down. This time, months later... Months later, the seven last bowl plagues have now gone, finished, gone on. We come and land on the Mount of Olives, probably on trumpets. It will be hard to know exactly which day is trumpets, except the Lord knows, it says. Except he himself knows. This time we come back on angelic white chargers, not on the clouds. Very likely feast of trumpets. So if Christ's first coming, his first coming back, I mean, the seventh trumpet, to me, it fits very nicely to have that on Pentecost. That's his first coming, to gather the elect, not in the fall, but with pictures. The time of the first fruits is in the spring. It's Pentecost. It's the time he comes for his bride. The bride are those who are filled and led by God's Spirit, are seeking his leading are overcoming, are fighting sin, like are asking God to make them holy. I can be holy only if God puts his presence in me. I can't make myself holy. God makes holy. 
those who are being led by his spirit, who are overcoming, that's, that's the bride. We go back to heavenly Jerusalem, we get married, the seven bowl plagues, we come back to earth, pictured by the two leavened loaves on Pentecost that were raised up and brought back down, pictured by Rebecca coming and meeting with Isaac, who was there with his father. And our Isaac, our Yeshua, is going to take us back to his father as well. And you can go back, I think it's in Galatians 4, that talks about uh, Sarah was a picture of heavenly Jerusalem. Where did, what did Rebecca and Isaac do? They went into Sarah's tent. Sarah had died now, but her tent was still there. And they went to Sarah's tent, and there they consummated their marriage. Leviticus 23, verse 17, the two leaven loaves. You shall bring from your dwellings two wave loaves of two tenths of an ephah. They shall be of fine flour. They shall be baked with leaven. They are the first fruits to Yehovah, raised up to heaven and brought back down again. So they shall be baked with leaven. Brethren, that talks about us. And we are first fruits. They are the first fruits, it says. James 1.18 says we are the first fruits. So, the, you know, they are those God is working with right now. And when we get married in heaven, because a king puts on a wedding for his son, where is that king? That's God the Father in heaven. I'm just reviewing that again so you get the timing. Seven bowl plagues go on. We get ready to return. Okay, let's keep reading. Now we're, now we're finally coming back to earth, I think, on Feast of Trumpets. Zechariah 14, verses 1 to 4. Behold, the day of Jehovah is coming, and your spoil will be divided in your midst. I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. The city will be taken, the houses rifled, the women ravished. That's not good, but it's going to happen. Half the city shall go into captivity, but the remnant of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Some will survive, half will go into captivity. And then Yehovah will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. And in that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west, making a very large valley. Half the mountain moves towards the north and half towards the south. Another big earthquake. Later in Zechariah 14, verses 12 to 13, we're told how those battling God, God's son, will die. It says their flesh literally dissolves out of their eye sockets. That's Zechariah 14, 12 to 13. The flesh on their bones dissolves away. And uh, an ugly, ugly ending, but it's, they're there to fight Christ, and he's not going to put up with it. People riot against you, you don't put up with it. You go with outstanding force, overwhelming force. This is the battle of Armageddon. Revelation 16, 16 describes them gathering around the valleys around Megiddo, the armies, before this. So there's coming soon, perhaps in the coming 10, 11 years, an invasion from outer space. And you and I will be part of it at the second coming of it, of hundreds of millions of powerful angelic holy angels, spirit angels of war, backing up their leader, the word of God, it says, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, I read that earlier, who will be seen by everyone when he comes by the first time in the clouds, gather his elect, go back to heaven, get married. Now they're coming back. That spirit leader will be Jesus Christ coming in his glory and power, returning to save us from ourselves. As sobering as all of that is, it is a day of wailing and all that. It says in Hebrews 9, 28, So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many to those who eagerly wait for him. He will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. For those who eagerly wait for him. It's not coming because of sin. Your sin's been forgiven. He's taken it upon himself. He's taken the wrath that you, that you uh, earned on himself. He's taken the penalties on himself. He's taken the fact you were cut off from God on himself. He was cut off for a while. He took the penalties. He was beaten, scourged, and killed. But those of us who eagerly wait for him, don't be afraid of his coming. Eagerly wait for it. 
Philippians 3, 20 to 21, our citizenship is in heaven. King James's conversation is citizenship. From which we also eagerly, eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he's able even to subdue all things to himself. Eagerly waiting for it. Trumpets is also a time of repentance. The Jews have that part right in the beginning of the ten days of all, of seeking our Father and King. It's a time to reset our relationships. Turn with me to Joel 2 again. We believers have to become one. We can't keep attacking each other. That's just crazy. Idiotic. We may have some doctrinal differences in how we see things. But before the wedding, we have to come together. We have to. I don't see Christ having a bride made up of people who, for the most part, don't want to talk to each other. We have to start coming together. We have to love especially God's other children who may not be part of your corporate group. Love them. Love them. It's so important that we repent as well, that God sees God says, even if you're getting married, go repent. Look, look what he says here. Joel 2, verses 15 to 17. Blow the trumpet, the shofar, in Zion. Consecrate a fast. Call a sacred assembly. Gather the people. Sanctify the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather the children, even the nursing babies. Let the bridegroom, he's about ready to get married, go out of his chamber let the bride he's going to get married to leave her dressing room. Let the priests who minister to Jehovah weep between the porch and the altar and let them say, Spare your people, O Jehovah. Do not give your heritage to reproach. That the nation should rule over them. Why should they say among the peoples, Where is their God? It's a time of repentance day of the Lord. It's a time of repentance, resetting our relationships with God. Now's the time to be sure you're getting zealous, fervent, right with Abba, right with Yeshua, facing up to weaknesses and sins you've kind of played with, lukewarm, lukewarmly, not zealously. Be sure you're seeking God in prayer, asking for Him to speak to you, letting the Holy Spirit guide you. He will. If you open your door to him, instead of having Jesus on the outside knocking on the door, the latest scenes, you have a high calling, brethren. I do and you do. Don't let anything or anyone distract you. Every day the sun sets means we're one day closer to this incredible return I've been talking about. Sometimes we find ourselves, I do, some you do, wandering off the path. We need to get up and repent. Sometimes we find ourselves bloodied in the battle we lost to temptation and weaknesses. Repent. Get back in the battle. I hope you're doing all that too. The next Holy Day then is this Sabbath. Uh, Feast of Trumpets, September 19th, and the Day of Atonement. A uh, day of fasting, a day of humbling ourselves. I have sermons on atonement as well. I don't know if I'm going to be able to have a new one because I'm going to the return which is on Sabbath, September 26th. I'm going to be in Washington, D.C., repenting of my sins and the sins of the nation and asking God to be merciful and asking God to spare his people, asking God to heal our land, asking God, first of all, to forgive me. And the others will be doing the same who are there. We're not there to ask for forgiveness of, of um, people we think are bad or whatever. That's up to God and them. God says, if my people called by my name, Second Chronicles 7, 13 and 14 says, when I send the locust and the plague and when I send the, the drought and the famine, all of that, if, when I do that, if my people called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked way, from their wicked way. 
then I will hear from, I will see, I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. I don't have that in front of me, so I hope that's pretty close to what it says. But anyway, that's what we're praying for. Forgive me of my sins and heal our land. If there were 10 righteous in Sodom, it would, it would not have been destroyed. There weren't 10. I'm hoping there are a lot that show up. But whether there's 10 that show up or 10,000 that show up or 100,000 that show up, I want to be part of it. I invite you to be part of it in a time of prayer on September 26th of repentance for your own sins and asking God to be merciful to the country. In the meantime, be abiding in Christ as never before. Without me, you can do nothing. Yeshua said, John 15, you abide in me and you're going to bear much fruit. You don't abide in me, you're going to be like a branch that withers. It's gathered up and burned. This is the same Yeshua, the Son of God, who said, one of, one of his, in John, it says, he said, I can do nothing apart from my Father. Nothing. That's what he said. If he said he can do nothing apart from the Father, why do we play with the notion of going through a day without prayer and study and abiding in him? In the meantime, though, the America's troubles are going to get worse and worse. But there will come a point where it ends and you and I will be hearing the last trumpet. We'll be looking up, singing our hosannas. He's finally here. Hallelujah. And we're changed blank, blink of, blink of an eye. Boom, just like that. To a spirit being, angels are soaring down, zooming down to pick us up. And hey, don't touch any controls yet. You don't know how to work the spirit body yet. We don't want you crashing into Mars. They'll be zooming down, picking us up, taking us to meet Yeshua in the clouds. And then we go up and meet our Father in heaven. We have the wedding. And then after the wedding, several months have gone by on earth. We now get on white chargers and come back to earth. A glorious time. Okay. Once the enemies are destroyed, that are assembled there, we will rebuild this planet. We will make it a Garden of Eden around the whole world. We'll take some time. But what a great time it will be, finally, to have the earth ruled by Yeshua and his people, you and I, will be his kings and priests, it says. And Revelation 20 says we shall reign with him for a thousand years. A thousand years. Come, Lord. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Yeshua. Father in heaven, send him. Thy kingdom come quickly, please. So until next time, this is your brother in Messiah with good news of our awesome Father and our wonderful Savior and King, Yeshua. And may his kingdom come to which there will be no end. Hallelujah. Praise his name. And may Jehovah bless you, smile on you, and grant you peace and shalom and blessings. I want to end with what John the Apostle says, even so, come, Lord Jesus, come. He says that at the end of Revelation 22. Father in heaven, please do come in the form of Yeshua. Send him to set up the millennial reign. Send him to end the chaos and the madness and the evil. And send him to deliver your people. Send him to bring the utopian world tomorrow. And wonderful time that it will be Help us begin to experience more intimately your kingdom, even now in this life. We're part of your kingdom. We're not part of this one. We're part of your kingdom. So, Father, we ask you, send Yeshua quickly, and may we be counted worthy to escape the things that are coming. May we be counted worthy of your kingdom and your calling. Smile on your people. Protect us in this hard, hard and difficult, dangerous time. Watch over us and help us seek you as we raise holy hands to you and praise you and glorify your holy, righteous name. Thank you, thank you. In Yeshua, our Savior and King. Amen. Visit the Light on the Rock website where you can view additional videos, over 270 sermons, and 300 blogs as a scriptural study resource for those who desire to know God the Father and His Son and His incredible plan for all mankind. We are not a church, but a non-profit organization 
providing in-depth biblical studies free for all who would like to visit our site. The Light on the Rock Foundation also supports an orphanage in Kenya, providing financial resources to support their living costs and education. We never ask for money. However, any donations are appreciated and will be used to support the Kenyan Orphanage and our site. Thank you for visiting. And if you find these teachings beneficial to you and your family, please share with others.